Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, my name is Margaret Murphy. I'm the principal and owner of Integrated Aquatic Sciences. I'll be your moderator today. I'm going to keep introductions very short for all of our presenters so they have the full time to present. Uh, we are going to try to keep a strict schedule since we do have two other concurrent sessions running with this. So our first speaker today is Thomas Evans uh, from SUNY ESF. Great, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. So what I'm going to talk about today is the growth of uh, lampreys in three different streams within New York. And I can advance things with this. Is that the? Yes. No. So in, actually in New York we have six species of lampreys, uh, but for the purposes of the talk today I'm going to just deal with two of them because they're the most widely distributed and also the most abundant within the state. And that's the American brook lamprey, which is common, uh, especially the Genesee and the, uh, the Allegheny and up by the St. Lawrence, and then the sea lamprey, which is distributed in a lot of different watersheds uh, throughout the state. So if you don't know anything about sea lamprey or you, you want a refresher on it, sea lamprey, which are the most commonly known lamprey, exhibit a life history that's very common for lampreys with a, uh, with a, with a long larval period, and a very weak laser point, let me switch to this, um, with a long larval period followed by this juvenile period, which is where the damage occurs if you're worried about fish stocks. The juvenile period is where they're actually feeding on other fish. But I focus primarily here on the larval period since it tends to be relatively long and dominates the life history of these guys. Um, and in this case, I'm showing you that it's, it's four years long, but the, what we're going to see in the talk is, is whether that's actually true. This is an estimate anywhere on average about uh, what we might expect to see for sea lamprey in New York. American brook lamprey are a little bit different from sea lamprey. They don't feed on other fish, right? So they avoid having that juvenile period and they turn right into an adult after they're done with their larval period. And so their entire life history is almost completely a larval with very short periods where you'll actually see them swimming around uh, as the adult. And for uh, the work that I did here, one of the questions I want to ask, of course, is, is how long does it actually take in the populations that I'm looking at um, in New York State? So this is a very characteristic uh, view of what Amnesty um, uh, location might look like. What you have is a, a lot of sedimentary deposits. There's often mud and sand in that area. There can be buildup of, of woody debris as well, which is, which is very common for these guys. Uh, you might have some buildup of uh, plant material around the side, depending on uh, how stable these environments are through time. And what I actually did was I went out and staked out sites uh, within these three different streams, which I'll show you uh, coming up here. And I did multi-class depletions at these sites through intervals of time. So I went out in 2014 and 2015, once each month to these sites. Uh, I, I went uh, from June to October in 2015, and then from May to October uh, in 2015, or sorry, 2014 and then 2015. And all the animals that were captured, I took their length and weight. And this is an, this study is a larger is a is a component of a, of a marking study. So this is a small piece of it. But these animals were also marked and then released into the I'm not really going to deal with that today, uh, but I am going to deal just primarily with the growth. So this is what these sites look like. I have sites distributed in the Genesee River, and those are American Brook lamprey. I have a site um, in the uh, Delaware River drainage, that's sea lamprey, and then another site of sea lamprey in the Hudson River. Uh, I think that's probably sufficient for this slide. These are my sampling dates, and that's the black line. So these are actually when I went out and sampled within the, the year. And the dotted line is the, uh, the precipitation, uh, the gauge height for a nearby USGS uh, stream gauge. So let's first start with the American Brook lamprey, uh, and then we're going to transition through the other sites. This is a length frequency distribution of American Brook lamprey. And one of the important things to note here is, is how long they actually might take to grow. And what you can see is that it appears, this is probably the most distinct grouping here, it appears that there's about, this is probably year one, uh, this is probably year two, uh, and then it looks like year three, the recent year three looks like somebody took a lawnmower to it, it's because at year three they become adults um, and they would go out and spawn at that point. Well the advantage of having this relatively long term uh, piece of data and also uh, continuous collection over these months is that we can follow these through time, right, so we can follow these peaks through time. So if this is in fact a, a year two peak, then that should appear um, immediately underneath this peak as it reaches year two. So if we go back here, I'm just going to use it when it's very clear in July. What we find out is we don't have a year two peak, and that appears that uh, that little tiny tail that's sitting off of what I initially called the year two peak 
is actually probably year two. And so these guys are actually probably a, a conglomerate of year three, year four animals, in fact. And then everything else is probably uh, in the order of four to five to six years old or more. And the reason that I'm so confident that these are actually year one is because I collect year zero animals within these populations fairly frequently. Uh, but not, this, not terribly different from what you see here where you have apparently failed, failed years relatively frequently. You can see that there was basically no recruitment um, in the prior year. So recruitment for these guys appears to be relatively variable and it may be dependent on how many animals are already present in the streams. So they may be limited by the number of animals that are already out there. So if you're actually going to go out and sample uh, lampreys within New York, I'd recommend looking into August and September when you have them of year coming downstream and also when you have the, the highest abundance of um, large animals still remaining. And if you fit a curve to that, so a longer and lengthy curve here, what you'll see, it's a little bit, the fit here starts to, to fall off as you get into these larger animals, but in general it's probably taking on the order of uh, four or five, uh, maybe up to eight years to reach uh, maturity. This dotted line here represents uh, the smallest adult that I captured at this site. So we're probably approaching that. Um, by the time you reach all the way out here, uh, most animals, if not all animals, are probably adults. And this is the number of animals at that site captured through time. Here again is that precipitate or the gauge height through time. And what I want you mostly to take away from this uh, is that numbers of animals, here's the numbers of animals, and again here's the gauge height are very much uh, driven by what look like precipitation events, right? So you can have relatively high numbers of animals, and after a single precipitation event, a lot of animals can wash out. And that seems to be characteristic um, of these habitats, in that these guys are relatively stable within their habitat, but if the right uh, rain events occur, and they occur at the right time of the year, which looks like spring or fall, then these animals will leave that site. Okay, so let's move on to Aquatic Creek, which is Sea Layer Bray, and that's located in the Delaware River drainage. This is a little bit different. So the length distribution here doesn't show a lot of clear peaks, and it looks more like somebody just smeared their finger through uh, the length frequencies. There may be some peaks um, located here, and I've outlined maybe how much they grow. You can see that they're growing about the same amount between years, right? This is May 2015, this is October 2014. Uh, that is it's hard to say exactly what year that might be, and I know that because uh, there are actually animals down here, I just don't catch them. They're very, very small and hard to actually get a hold of. But those are probably young up here. Uh, we're dealing with animals that uh, appear in the population in August and September, and they're about 11 to 12 millimeters long, but at that point they're so small, it's hard to actually get an idea about how many are out there. I can tell you that in 2014, there were so many that you could have picked up sand in the stream and you would have had uh, 10 or 20 small animals in your hand. In 2015, that was not the case. You would only get a few animals. Again, these are native populations, so they're probably going through uh, these things sort of normally. So if we look at uh, how long it takes, so this, let's say this is throughout the entire growing season, so that, that the, like, the distribution here would give us an idea, right, so there's our young of year. That little tiny black line represents how much these guys might grow within the growing season, and you draw that out. Uh, that actually would mean that these guys are about 24 years old. So that, uh, that seems relatively long, especially for a larval organism, but that's actually not outside of the range of what we know anesthetes can live for. We know they can probably live up to a couple of decades. So these numbers up here probably represent, uh, this doesn't mean by default that these are automatically 24-year-old animals. What it means is that if you're in, the population, in these populations and you, you remain in those populations for your entire life, you will grow very slowly, most likely, and it will take you extremely long periods of time to get to these larger sizes. This population also, I, I did, uh, you can see here that the captures of animals through time and then of course the gauge height of a nearby station nearby. Uh, the, the similarity here where you have uh, animal number of animals declining through time, but you don't have a single large rain event, so it seems relatively steady. On the other hand, um, in September and October when we did have rain events, that seemed to drive the population. So again, it looks like these animals are persistent in these habitats during the spring, or they, during the summer when there aren't rain events. During the fall, they'll probably get washed out. But if there isn't a fall rain to wash them out, they remain there uh, for the remainder of the winter probably. Okay, so let's look at uh, Sea Lamprey and Cedar Pond Brook. Cedar Pond Brook is a, a, uh, a tributary of the Hudson River. And this distribution, so there are fewer numbers of animals here. I have, uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One is I have fewer numbers of dates of these animals actually collected than the other sites. 
And the other thing is that this site, uh, a lot of the, the initial sites that I laid out to sample in were washed away while I was working, um, so that I, I didn't get access to those later. And that occurred primarily between May and June. But I do have a relatively large number of animals, so we can actually draw on some length frequencies. And when you do that, let's these these animals throughout May and May and July, which are probably year one, don't appear to grow very much. They in fact maybe shrink a little bit. These animals entering the population down here are probably young of year, and they appear to be relatively uh, fast growing relative to the other population. So if these are in fact year one, um, and that would mean that these might be year two, and maybe these are three, uh, and maybe these are year four, and then out here we have larger than four. And if we actually go in and say, okay, well, let's take, let's assume these are year zero, and let's measure the distance between that that mean peak um, and the mean peak for. Uh, year one, so let's say this is the growth that occurs for one full year, and this dotted line now represents the size they need to attain before they can become um, a juvenile and go out downstream to feed on uh, fishes. Now if we take that measurement, well lo and behold, if you double it exactly, it lands right on the middle of that peak, and if you triple it, of course it lands right in the middle of that peak, and so forth and so on. And so that means to actually get out here, you would probably need about six years if you're growing at that speed uh, throughout your lifespan. So why don't we have lots of large animals at that site? And if you remember, there was a number of events that occurred not more than six years ago that probably washed all those animals out of that site. So we have a number of storm events that probably washed almost everything out of those sites. And so populations in Cedar Prong Brook probably represent a, a native population of sea lamprey that's recovering from a large scale event that washed animals downstream in that way. And this is, uh, again, a similar thing to what I showed you before. You can, at this point down here, Part of the reason that captures were hard to collect during the uh, middle of summer is that at Cedar Park Road, there are a lot of plants, and sea lampreys grow very well, apparently, in plants. Uh, there is sediment underneath them, and so it was very hard to capture uh, these larval sea lamprey because they would be submerged under the plants, and I just couldn't see them. I know that they were there because I would recapture them in September, uh, but they, I couldn't actually tell at them in August. So ignoring this single point down here, what you can see is we don't really have any rain events while I was, I was uh, out sampling in the, the middle of uh, the summer, and that appears to, to the population relatively stable with some additions from young of year as those recruit downstream. And here, uh, where there was a rain event, right, there's a large drop in numbers, but that occurs earlier in the this, in this summer spring um, period. Okay, so the other component of this that I'm going to talk about today is mortality, uh, and this is actually a dead embassy that I found at one of my sites, and mortality is a really important driver, right, for, for determining how, uh, why you would remain in the site and, and what are the risks to doing that. And if you estimate mortality uh, for amices from other studies, so if you go and look at, at amices from other studies, what you find is that uh, the mortality is highly variable, right? We can get down to 4%. These are for caged animals in the wild, so there's nothing feeding on them, supposedly. And then you can get probably up to maybe 50 or 60%, depending on what you're doing um, with different years. And these have been estimated for different species, but not, not for a lot of species, and certainly not for a lot of locations. So I used a variety of different uh, mortality estimation tools to actually go about uh, estimating the mortality. I'm not going to talk about each one uh, in, in detail. If you, if you would like to, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Uh, I'm also trying to get this published, so if you are interested in seeing it, uh, let me know. And if it gets published, I'll, I will send you the paper. But in any case, what you can see is uh, that when you estimate mortality for Dyke Creek, which is American Brook Lamprey in the um, uh, the Genesee River, you generally have generally have mortalities that are lower. You have maybe your lowest is about 25% up to, this is a catch curve where we have animals, of course, that being uh, compounded by the fact that animals are washing down the site. But you have, you have uh, estimates all the way up to maybe 95% or 85% if we ignore that catch curve. Oquaga Creek, which is sea lamprey in the Delaware River, appears much lower, and that's partially because their growth appears so much lower. And then at Cedar Park Brook, mortality appears much, much higher. And that may, in fact, be related partially, again, to having that truncated length frequency curve, which may be a result of storm events that are driving them. So the, the averages here, again, these are, these are relatively large um, errors associated with them, but I think the averages are meaningful to a degree. Uh, Cedar, the Dyke Creek, again, the American Brook Lamber appear to have a mortality of around 50, maybe up to 60% per year. Cedar Prong Brook of Sea Lamprey appear to be about the same, maybe slightly higher right, year to year. And Aquaga Creek appears very, very low, but again, that may be driven by other things. Uh, those animals are growing very, very slowly, and it may not be, uh, it may be very hard to estimate mortality in those cases. 
Like I said, that's fairly reasonable based on what we know, probably within the 50% range. So what we've estimated before for amnesties of about 50% mortality per year, this seems relatively reasonable. Um, and that seems relatively reasonable between locations. And unfortunately, um, I, it's always hard to predict what pictures will look like on a projector, but you'll have to bear with me. I've tried to point these out with arrows and other signs. What is actually driving that mortality, it's not clear. I didn't study that directly, but we, I have a lot of indication that there are uh, animals being fed on regularly. So up here at the top, if we start up here, there's actually a scar on the right, a wound on the back of this animal that's in the shape of a U, right? So it looks like something grasped it at some point and then let go. The animal's able to, to escape. This darker image, unfortunately, you can't see very well. Um, there's a lot of tumorous growths that are probably related to some sort of pathogen that's occurring within that animal. This animal that looks like I sliced the tail off, I did not actually slice the tail off. That animal actually had its tail bitten off at some point. And then unfortunately, you can't see it down here, but this animal has two scars on its body that are from puncture wounds. So at some point, it was grabbed by something and it left uh, puncture wounds on the body. All right, with that, I would like to thank the Hudson River Foundation for their help in funding this project. And then uh, there are a number of other people that assisted both in the field and also in helping me find locations and information uh, to go out and collect those animals. And I'll take any questions if there's any time left. also between cedar pond probably representing something of a, re of a recovered population as opposed to a stable population is also probably driving some of those differences. And it may also be partially dependent on uh, flow uh, and the, the environment that's around them. Uh, cedar pond Brook and, and Dyke Creek are in very, very forested areas with some ag around them. Uh, and cedar, uh, sorry, Dyke Creek and Aquatic Creek are forested in ag. Cedar pond Brook tends to be very, very urbanized around it. Uh, that does support lampreys. So there are probably enough site differences that would drive some of those things, but I don't know specifically which one would do that. Thank you. Very large, very large uh, 
nets, but they actually capture very large gobies. Um, the small, the bottom graph is our 30 foot staining survey. It uses very, very small mesh, and uh, it generally captures, captures a lot smaller gobies. But as you can see, we've seen this really great increase in goby populations over time. And 2015, we actually got the highest numbers of both large and small gobies. So these things are still increasing in our area and are still very problematic. So why actually study the round goby? The round goby uh, does a lot of things in ecosystems. Uh, they're a known disease vector. Um, they also displace a lot of native organisms, such as sculpins, log perch, and darters. Uh, they're also a known egg predator, uh, particularly our centrarchids, uh, lake trout, and also a sauce that's something I touched on uh, last year in my presentation. But uh, they also have this great potential to alter our native food webs. Um, they consume a variety of different prey, uh, mussels, diptera, zooplankton, small fish, and even fish eggs. But it's unclear how these diets actually differ by location or by different size classes, particularly the very large size class that we're seeing in the San Lawrence River. So our research objectives for this uh, were, does location matter? So it, are different bays behaving differently in the San Lawrence River? Are gobies consuming different items? And also, does size or length uh, affect round goby diets? What are these really, really large gobies shown here in the, in the red? What are they doing to the system? What are they feeding on? Uh, how, how much is that going to hurt our ecosystems? So in order to answer this question, we collected uh, 40 round gobies from three bays in the St. Lawrence River. We collected 20 uh, large gobies. So these are gobies greater than 130 millimeters, all the way up to 235 and then 20 small round gobies, uh, 48 to 129. And these small gobies are what m n normally people think of as a regular size goby. The large gobies are extremely large. Um, and then we analyzed all these gobies for length, weight, uh, diet, uh, dry weight, and abundance, which is more of a snapshot of what, what they're feeding on. And then also stable isotope content, which is a little bit more integrated approach to see what they're actually feeding on. For our stomach contents, we sorted them all to the lowest identifiable taxonomic group, uh, dried and weighed each of the items, um, and then we analyzed them using an MDS ordination, uh, an anisim pairwise test, and we also did a feeding diagram to develop my Evanson at all. Our stable isotopes, uh, we used the same 120 round gobies, um, took tissue from them, uh, sent them to our Cornell Stable Isotope Laboratory, dried, weighed, and run through a mass spec. Uh, and these isotopes give us, uh, we, the two we focus on here are carbon and nitrogen. So nitrogen will actually tell you trophic level, uh, the higher up uh, your animal is feeding on, a, on the trophic level, the higher nitrogen value you'll have. And carbon, uh, you are what you eat, so uh, your carbon signature will show what you're actually, that animal is actually feeding. So the combination of uh, isotopes and a diet will give a pretty good understanding of what these animals are actually eating. So this is uh, dry weight data for our uh, stomach contents. So these are NDS ordinations. So uh, the way you want to look at these is just it's, if a fish is eating similar to another fish, each of these points is a fish, they'll be very close to each other. And if there's good separation between groups, that means that your two groups or three groups are eating differently from one another. So our top graph, you can really see that out of our three sites, there doesn't really seem to be any differences between the three bays that we looked at. And that was confirmed by our Anison as well. Um, a little bit more interestingly is the differences between size and us. So the bottom graph there, you can see that there actually is very good clear separation between our large gobies and our small gobies across all of our sites. Um, and our Anison confirmed that yes, that this is significantly different. But that doesn't actually tell you what large gobies and small gobies are actually eating. Why are they coming out differently? Uh, this is average percent weights um, for large gobies versus small gobies. And a couple things I want to highlight here is that Large gobies are really consuming a significant, significantly more uh, drycinid mussels in their diet, uh, while our smaller gobies are consuming significantly more eggs and also coronavids. Uh, so there does seem to be some differences that we can pull out right away just from looking at this data. 
but this won't actually tell you too much about what they're actually selectively feeding on, whether or not they're specializing on a certain thing or generally feeding on it, uh, which is why we used uh, this, uh, this uh, diagram developed by Edmondson et al. And what this does is this actually tries to plot out uh, your individual prey items and see whether or not uh, your a, a fish, such as Argo B, is actually feeding specially on something or generally on something. And the way it works is you have a frequency of abundance on your x-axis um, and your prey-specific abundance on your y-axis. And if, say, you have a goby that all, all, all your gobies in your sample are eating coronavids, but coronavids in any one diet don't make up that much of any one diet, then it's going to fall out in a dominant but not important on the lower right-hand corner. But if you have a goby that consumed one very large fish, uh, but no other gobies consumed a very large item like that. Um, a fish would come out as important, but it's not actually a dominant thing that they're feeding on. Uh, so we're going to use this uh, going forward. So our smaller round gobies, we can a couple things we can see. Uh, so most items are appearing under rare or generalist. So we can kind of think of as. Uh, Small, go small gobies are actually appear to be generalist consumers. Uh, the one exception is the coronamids, uh, which most gobies ate coronamids, but in any one sample, they weren't uh, a significant portion of that diet. This is a lot different than our large gobies. Our large gobies, you can see, still have a lot of things that are in the rare or generalist category, but dricinid mussels really come out in the specialist dominant area. So not only were a lot of large gobies consuming dricinid mussels, but it was also making up a large portion of those gobies' diets. So those are, they're specializing on those, which is a big difference than, uh, than our small gobies. The, the other one exception is you can see BSB is Brooks stickleback, so we actually found a fish inside of one of our large gobies, um, but it was only in one fish, and it did make up pretty much the whole diet of that fish. So it came out uh, in the upper left hand corner. So it's important, but not a really dominant prey item. So now that we've uh, got that out of our uh, diet samples, we want to look at our isotope samples and see if this actually agrees. Uh, are round gobies, larger round gobies, actually specializing on tricinid muscles? Uh, this is nitrogen. So this is, you can think of as trophic level. Uh, you can see that there really doesn't seem to, seem to be too much variation among our sites, um, but there is this decreasing trend um, that's significant with uh, larger ground goby size. So normally you think of as a larger fish eating higher on the food chain. It's actually the opposite for round goby. So they're actually feeding uh, lower on, the, on our trophic level, which is probably indicative of the fact that they're consu consuming dricinid mussels, which are, which are pretty large. <coughs> What will tell you a little bit more information about what they're feeding on is our carbon. So this is you are what you eat. Uh, you can see that uh, really clear trends here that there doesn't really seem to, again, to be much variation among our sites. But uh, between our size classes, you can see that you have this, for our small gobies, it's very, uh, we have a high degree of variability. While our large gobies, it's very truncated. They're all pretty much eating exactly the same thing. And you can see this significant uh, decreasing trend here with increasing round goby length, uh, which plateaus around net minus 22. And published literature and some of our samples as well suggest that minus 22 is about what dricinids are. So this is a pretty good indication that they are, in fact, eating on uh, dricinid mussels. So with taking all these things together, uh, our diet and stable isotopes have, uh, they, there's very little variation between our sites. So out of our three different base sites, a goby in one bay is going to consume a very similar thing to a goby in a different bay in the San Lawrence River. But there does seem to be a, a big differences among our two size classes. So our large gobies are the ones that are really specializing on our dricinid mussels. While our large goby, or our small gobies, are actually generalists, but they're the ones that are actually consuming the eggs, uh, at least that we found. So, what does this actually mean? Um, 
small gobies may actually affect our native ecosystems a lot more than uh, larger round gobies, as they're the ones that are consuming a bunch of different prey items and consuming the eggs. Um, but our large gobies um, are still going to affect our ecosystems. Uh, they're still consuming a lot of different prey items, but they're, special, they're especially going after these dracinid mussels. And their populations may actually be related to the number of the dracinid mussels in a system. You may not actually get uh, these very, very large individuals without dracinid mussels being present. Um, and with that, I uh, want to thank a whole bunch of people. This project wouldn't have been possible without them and uh, our financial support. Thanks, and I'll take any questions.
Yeah, so um, we saw the main, like, we see the switch over around 90, 100. Yeah, so most, most previous studies have really looked at uh, a lot smaller size class. So usually you think about a diet switch occurring around either 75 or 90. Uh, we chose 130 um, because we were really getting good separation um, with our different capture methods and our different locations. Um, and we also got really good sample size of above 130. And, and below it. And our initial uh, preliminary test showed that there did seem to be um, some sort of uh, some sort of separation there. And when we did the isotopes, um, you can oh, so, but you can kind of see that at 130 is really where it appears that everything past that was just folks uh, around minus 22 and everything above that um, was kind of generally all over the place. And, and we did, I did look at it in a couple other size class breakups, but nothing really seemed as pronounced as, as 130. So, like that was growth rate, growth rate, how long does it take from small size to small size? To get to the large. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure on that question. I have pulled some otoliths and looked at them, but it's not as long as uh, you would think. I think it's probably uh, on the order of five-ish years to get past 130. All right, thank we'll you. cap it there. Thank you very much. so they can get caught up. So for those that are trying to switch, we apologize, but they are about 15 minutes behind. Our next speaker, oh, this is, is this one thing? No. I noticed they cut out on All right, well, technology is great when it's work. Our next speaker is Doug Carlson. He's a biologist with the New York State DEC. If you don't know him, you have not asked him to identify a fish for you. But he will uh, talk to us today about endangered and threatened species in New York State. topic is a, a favorite of mine and it's uh, got a lot of other issues involved and I'm going to dodge around a lot of them but the uh, first if you ask the question when it probably includes the why what when and where also and mostly dwelling on the, the when the process so when have endangered species or threatened species and I put them both together because I don't think they're very easily distinguished between the two when do they get down classified on a state list or on a federal list? Uh, federal, of course, is uh, another thing I'm staying quite away from, but uh, it's never happened in New York that we've moved a fish from threatened and endangered down to something less, but we've only had the process happen once before, and it might be happening again for an opportunity. And then politics are involved in endangered species. Certainly at the federal level, we become aware of it. Civil servants might be the main decision makers or uh, appointed officials. It's, it's a process that uh, lots of people are engaged in and trying to make it work the best they can. And the long and the short of the definition, it being uh, something I'll get to in a minute here, but when they're soon to be gone, no longer soon to be gone, that might make you think they should be removed from the list. Black button shuts it off. <laughs> Endangered species comes down to some very simple words, eminent or in the very near future to become extirpated, and then threatened is just one step down from it. it. Some people say it's likely to become endangered in the near future, or you can just put it into a later time context of 
uh, soon, not in the immediate future, and extirpate it, different from extinct, of course, in a particular state, if it's gone, we're calling it extirpated or in a particular watershed. And there are several fish, when you get down to the watershed level, that have been extirpated. Um, and when they're completely gone from the state, we would say that's extirpated across the state. Down classified is uh, a, a process, I guess, that we haven't seen in many instances. But when uh, you feel that it's no longer goes categories above, you'd think that a move would be afoot to no longer have it classified as threatened or endangered. What are the candidates that might be down classified, or what are the, the fish that are presently on our list in New York, as there's 19 of them. The list comes from quite a ways back, and I'll get to that in a minute, but the yellow highlighted species are those which are already extirpated or have always been extirpated for over 50 years, always, I mean. And in the darters, there's one that's been gone for a long time, the gilt darter, the sunfishes, the mud sunfish has been gone. So we have quite a diverse list of fish that have gotten this special attention. And some of them, like the deep water scope, and look like a blob when you take them out of the place that they live. The upside down ones are ones we haven't seen for a long time. The silver chub's been gone since the 30s. And the sand darter, uh, not too highly recognized fish that people have seen it, I mean, but it's it's, uh, it's a beauty of a fish. <clears throat> the history of our endangered species classification for the state started back in 1983, and a process for reclassifying it started uh, not a terrible time long later, just those seven years later, that the process was started with expert panels meeting, and it was quite a stretched out process before those decisions could be put into law, but it was a, a very, uh, well-rounded process, I guess you'd say. A lot of people were involved and opportunities for continuing review of it. They got put into our, our law, as I say, in 1999. And the second process has been uh, intended to get started and, and perhaps will start in the coming year. The, the process by which it might follow is, uh, <clears throat> might, the criteria that people often use or the metrics, is it still there? Is it not there as much as it used to be? And what's likely to make it be disappearing? The threats are often hard to identify, and, and we're pretty good at saying afterwards, it looks like that was it. But during the process, it usually happens so quickly that you uh, just grasp what else has changed, and maybe you put an assignment on it. As you'll be hearing later from uh, Dave Sanderson how the long-eared sunfish or the northern sunfish it's hard to put your finger on what might have caused the demise of certain species. We just don't know a lot about what's going on with those species. So the next process for reclassifying, if it's in this year ahead or perhaps the year after, it probably uh, really heavily depend upon published reports of what's going on for that particular fish. And we don't see a lot of reports for these fish. One of these two fish I'm going to be talking about, we don't see many reports about the sand dart, the status of a fish. Lots of times there'll be science about a particular fish, but it doesn't get to the real technical, is it disappearing or uh, is it increasing? We more study the special details of what's going on in its life in the best areas that we can find to study them. So the reports that might be coming for this process are underway, and as you'll be hearing later more about <clears throat> deep water scope and there's a lot known about it and it's, it's really encouraging news and I'm going to be giving more encouraging news for these two species that I'm saying are good candidates and uh, more about that in a minute. So some questions about what controls the process. Why are fish down classified? When should we be uh, encouraging the process? Who's to benefit by a fish being down classified or being classified up to a higher level? And there are groups that favor no change. Preservationist groups often are outspoken or uh, just special interests often recognize this powerful process of protection, something they can intercede with and, and persuade the process the direction they want it to go. In some of the states near us, as uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania have both down classified a darter that's a uh, bluebreast darter, not very widely known, but it's a, a spectacular fish. And there's such a pronounced increase across both of those states 
where this fish previously occurred and where it's now able to be found, that it was an easy process for them, I might say. I don't really know what the process was, but uh, the evidence is overwhelming that some fish have just had such increases, and those states have processes that have probably been exercised regularly, so they just moved them up in the last year to have bluebreast starter uh, no longer being endangered or threatened. And what interest groups do we have out there? If you're working with a bird of group, a group of birds, you can certainly appeal to the bird groups to help you out on giving an animal a particular extra protection. If it was a lamprey, as the northern brook lamprey might need protection, you have to hunt a long ways to find a group that might want to help you protect some <laughs> like those. Or maybe there would be some groups that would help you down classify them and get them off the list so they can be managed a little more effectively. I'm appealing to this group as, uh, as our parent chapter of the American Fisheries Society has a pretty big role in the federal classification of, of fish particularly. They publish lists fairly often of what that group of professionals as a committee uh, deliberates on and of course they have lots of scientific reports to help guide them when should fish be put on the list or taken off the list at the federal level. I think there's some in, 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 uh, intuitive or some instincts we have to give animals more protection and it's maybe at the times we're in that there aren't many emotions moving toward less protection and yet I'm appealing that that should be an equal balanced kind of set of emotions that when people see that there's good evidence for a fish to be down classified then it takes a little more inertia to get it moving because it's a rarely exercised process to down classify. And if you have experts uh, examining the material available to them, or if you have a, a model, which has often been the case that there's some kind of combination of metrics that go together and they come up with a number and it says this, is, this group of animals with this uh, score should be no longer classified or should be classified. And models are only as good as the critiquers, the people reviewing it, that really want to put it to the test. And we've had good uh, experience being able to modify those models as they've been created for us. So now on to the second part of the talk that gets out of the political process and gets more into the scientific. I think we're more comfortable with what does the data show. And the two examples I draw from, uh, one of them is really data rich in recent times thanks to the USGS and, and our, our uh, Ontario counterparts that are studying this big water. I really like this genus name, Myoxocephalus or Cephalus. How can you go wrong with such a group of letters like that? <laughs> I haven't heard it spoken very often, but, but it's something about its head. I guess you'd think if it's down deep, its head might be squished a little bit, and, and the pictures make it look pretty squished up too. This Thompson guy, uh, this fish has also historically been known in marine areas, so there's been a taxonomic shifting of some of the things about deep water smoke. You can see I'm trying to be more relaxed now because I'm out of the political process. <laughs> it's just about the fish. And the eastern sand darter has been studied a fair bit in New York, certainly a fair bit in other places, but it's not highly renowned. It's, uh, it's a beautiful fish that uh, dives down into the sand, and certainly that habitat it might be more connected to that than all the other fish that we put names on that make you think it ought to be where it is by the name, but not necessarily holding true very often. So a short story about deep water sculpin. A uh, year and a half ago, I got to go on a cruise with the USGS out from Oswego, and, and the uh, deep water that they went to, down to 100 meters where they started catching them, brought up lots of other fish, lots of other animals, not so many other fish. But it, trawl haul. Some of them came up with lots of descended mussels and then others uh, didn't have so many, but this all had maybe 30 or 50 uh, deep water sculpins among, mixed amongst those mussels. Borrowing some information from the USGS, the graph on the lower right with really intense effort in the last summer showing how broadly across the lake they are, east to west, north to south, and even some in the shallower part to the eastern basin. But 100 meters is a figure that they like to say is a, a good working term and also found deeper in the lake. And this previous sampling on the graph to the left, methods weren't as well refined as they are now, but there were a few records 
in the early years, and thanks to the museums that archive them, we have uh, just a few records going to a lot of records, is the gist of this, and then a, a little graph representation of the longer time span on the left, graph to the left over all the years with a few very low bars in the 1910s and the 1940s, and then this rapid increase, which is explained a little more detail in the lower right, where the uh, bars are with more years of sampling, and, and it's the number of records. If you go out and run 20 toes, and each one of those is considered a record, you have a certain number of fish in each toe, but this is not number of fish, just number of sample efforts. So um, a, a really large number in recent years, over 200 samples in that time, time uh, unit of, of 10, uh, three years. Now to jump on to the other fish, which is in several parts of New York, and historically, which is just in a few parts, and it's uh, in small streams, it's in Lake, Lake Erie, and the places we have known of them in the blue, the two streams to the left, Casanova Creek and Cataraugus Creek, were, uh, where sand artists were caught before 1900, and sampling wasn't very thorough then, of course, to all the places that they might have been. In the 1930s, there's another stream highlighted over there. It's not really highlighted. Little salmon was caught. Was a place. So we have uh, this is some repetition of the same information that the uh, early records from Cataraugus Creek and Casanova Creek, Buffalo area having lots of changes. Cataraugus Creek also having lots of changes in those years of the early 1900s, and they were never caught there again. Little Salmon River on the short bar there had them caught in the 1930s, and they continue to be caught today. And all these additional streams that the previous slide showed, the Oswagachi grass and tributaries of some of those, the Deer River tributary of St. Regis. The Boquette River had a sand darter record from just three years ago for the first time. Those at the south end of Lake Champlain have been known for only 20 years, 20 to 30 years. And Lake Erie has had some sampling complements to the trawling and seining along the shores of Lake Erie that have had them up to uh, for the last 15 years. And then to generalize a little bit, what's brought about the recovery of these species? That, or, as I said earlier, what accounts for a species to disappear from our detection level? It's hard to say what's uh, making them come back. It's easy to say water quality improvements. And in the case of the two habitats, there's been lots of changes in 50 years. The streams, we have further insight about the sand arters, uh, currents in some of the streams south of Lake Champlain that has been said that back in the 30s, there probably wasn't that much sand there on the benthic surface where otherwise it might be covered with silt. So the sand might have cleaned up over the periods of less deforestation and better land use practices. But it's still just, uh, we're not sure, and we're not even sure how to measure how the magnitude of habitat improvements. It's easy to say that we've got this fish that's uh, returned, and that, that's quite a quality measurement. The sand arters are in 17, in 15 streams now, instead of the earlier record of only three. And, uh, Deepwater scoping are caught in hundreds of trawl poles out in Lake Ontario. So to pull it together in the final sense, the protection of species by an endangered species law is a very powerful tool and it helps us with lots of habitat protection, certainly not only for these species that it's directed at. And we're very glad for the, uh, the tools we have to keep our habitats from degrading further. Initiation of the process for updating the fish in New York is, is far overdue and many people are working rigorously to get engaged in perhaps in the next year or the next couple of years. And the two species that I've summarized the information for, there's been such dramatic changes, and there needs to be uh, reports, scientific reports, that put this in the management perspective. Not only it, can you catch it in more places, and particularly how one depth might be different from another, but an overview kind of report that says the species across the state has had these dramatic changes, and to make a sort of a judgmental call to say that it looks like it's not going to disappear in the near future. And groups can uh, enlighten themselves and encourage others to get reports done. It really boils down to the scientific process of saying, here's the data, and then the deliberation process 
can rely upon those published reports. So some credits that I need to extend to others that have participated in, certainly the study groups that have collected this information, and the extent of the rare fish project that's been uh, in place for over 20 years. And Dean Bowton was the leader of that effort that gave us some, uh, certainly gave us some management plans or recovery plans for some of the species and some programmatic uh, plans for the project overall. And then all of the records that we have. New York has such a rich history of fish records, and we're so lucky to have this Woolman that did the sampling back before 1900, and the uh, universities that keep collections where we can answer our questions of what did it really look like, the fish that was back in 1930s. Was it really a deep water scope? So that covers it. Any questions? put together, the, uh, I guess I wouldn't say report, summary documents for each species, and a lot of those have still been retained. And then in the process in 1990, uh, a group was pulled together of interested experts, and they had, they called them dossiers, or uh, packets of information for each species, and, and the groups talked about it for a day, had summaries, and then it was acted upon the process that might take place now could follow a process that was started a year and a half ago. We had a process for species of greatest conservation need and that information and the way those groups deliberated is available, might be used, probably will be used to some extent, but there might also be uh, another group that has to be assembled. So I'm not, we're hopeful that it'll be started and questions, it's good to ask questions of, of uh, agency folks that are closest to having that put in gauge, put in gear. So a lot of these fish just haven't been uh, popularly talked about, whether the gravel chub, one out of a hundred people have heard about gravel chubs, uh, and it's very narrowed in its distribution, and other fish are pretty widely spread as, as perhaps pirate perch should be elevated in our thinking. Well, not many people have handled pirate perch either. Thanks for your attention, and I hope people direct more efforts toward these species. Thanks, Doug. Our next speaker is David Sanderson Hilkenstein yeah, <laughs> um, from SUNY Brockport. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about the uh, wild population of northern sunfish. David Sanderson Kilstein again, um, and as Doug mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, one of the state's more critically endangered uh, fish, and the, the political aspects of that I am not even going to mention. So. <laughs> um, where do we point this thing? There we go. Okay. So just a quick refresher: uh, the four species of sunfish of Western New York. Um, we've got pumpkin seed, northern sunfish, bluegill, green sunfish, um, co-occurring in a lot of watersheds in the western part of the state. A quick overview of long ear slash northern sunfish. Um, the name used to be synonymous. Uh, they were recently separated between northern sunfish and the southern populations uh, retained the long ear part of the name. They used to be subspecies, and uh, now it's Lepomus peltastes and Lepomus megalotus, supposedly, um, very recently. So we're going to be focusing right there on 
of Western New York. Some quick background on the recovery program um, Doug Carlson has been working on for a while, um, as well as Scott Wells, if he is here. Um, they, uh, in 2005, with SUNY Brockport, went in to do an assessment on um, the same population I'll be talking about today. Um, well, Scott Wells and Ross Abbott actually caught 23 uh, fish in this location. Um, they took some of these fish as well as some uh, northern sunfish from other populations to establish hatchery ponds from which they could restock uh, the northern sunfish into uh, its previous historic range as well as some other sites that Scott identified. This looks messy because well, they've been busy <laughs> throwing these fingerlings all around the place. Um, so anywhere there's a triangle, um, that's where they were able to be recaptured uh, following stocking. Um, so quite a broad range all the way from Syracuse to the Buffalo area, to Monroe, Monroe and North, well I guess not Monroe, but Orleans County here. Um, and I will be focusing mostly on this little stretch right here called Lower Tonawanda Creek. Um, it's a large creek, but a small area. <laughs> so, 2013 I went in uh, to this Lower Tonawanda Creek section and I was unable to capture a northern sunfish, unfortunately. Went back in in 2004 uh, to the same site as well as other sites that Doug and others with him have been restocking northern sunfish, still couldn't capture any. So, asked a lot of questions as to why, what happened, what has changed in this area. Um, and the way I did that was I took Scott's data from 2005 and compared it to my fish catches. Um, and uh, interestingly, as a, a very strange phenomenon, um, we had a lot of, I captured a lot of specimens that didn't fit keys, made my eyes cross, and <laughs> nobody really had a good idea what they were. Um, so I kept them, I held on to them, and I'll be talking about them at the end. Um, they're the hybrids, the fun part. This is specifically where I went um, in the Cayuga, Ellicott. Here's Little Tonawana Creek from the confluence with the Erie Canal up to the uh, Millersport Riffle at Transit Road, um, as well as I went all the way out um, to near Alexander, uh, past Daring Lake, um, some sites there looking for long year. So, um, my 2013-2014 data comprised a lot of effort. Um, Roughly 48,000 fish captured, handled. Um, unfortunately, the 2014 data, we were so focused in trying to get a single northern sunfish, uh, we only used presence absence data. So that left me with one year's data set that I could use to compare to Scott Wells' data to do fish community analysis using catch per unit effort, um, using Simpson's index of diversity and then some fancy multivariate techniques that give you pretty graphs. Uh, just to clarify, this left me with 18 hours of electroshocking power on time of effort compared to Scott's data. Um, like I said, catch per unit effort comparisons are just a way that we can standardize the abundance of separate species in the community. Um, overall, Catch per unit effort increased from 2005 to 2013 by roughly 400 fish per hour of electroshocking to 611 fish per uh, hour of electroshocking. This is mostly due to this gigantic green bar of my 2013 data um, attributed to green sunfish. Massive increase, over 900% increase in green sunfish abundance. 2005 to 2013. And there's some other interesting changes here. Oops, I had pointers. Does this point? Well, it kind of does, not really. Some other interesting changes I'll be talking about in a, just a quick summary, but 
Um, darters and log perch fell off the map. Um, there's some other individual species that saw decreases, some of the suckers, uh, red horses as an overall, and as well as round goby increased by three times uh, their abundance. Give it a small abundance, but when you're elect boat electroshocking in eight to ten feet of water, to get any round gobies is kind of a surprise, um, as well as some other changes which I will come back to you real quick. Oh. We do have something here. Oh my God. There we go. Thank you. Now I can go back to here. Okay. So, um, we also did a mini study. As I said, the green sunfish, a gigantic increase, um, led us to wonder specifically how many green sunfish are in this area. Can people in the back hear me now? Yay, hello. Awesome. <laughs> So, specifically, we went in, um, we did four mark recapture, uh, sampling dates using the Schnabel method. Um, all green sunfish that we easily identify as green sunfish, roughly one inch and larger, we marked. Um, and I think a lot of people here are familiar with mark recapture, so I'm not going to go into the specific methods, but we estimated roughly um, 1.2 green sunfish per meter, um, or five per six meters, whatever that works out to. Um, that's quite a lot of green sunfish when you, when you think about it. Um, over 8,000 in this single stretch, 3.7 kilometers. Um, might not sound that high, but when you look at the rest of the Centaurica community, it's just massively dominated by them. Um, so, Another comparison was we did a, a Simpsons Index of Diversity comparison between 2005 and 2013. This is really specific, isn't it? Um, and uh, species richness decreased. The diversity overall um, had a significant change, um, 0.004 levels. That's one of those small p-values uh, we like to see, I guess at least to give us some, some answers. Um, multivariate stuff, I won't go into too much detail of the metrics and the nitty gritties, but um, using ANASEM, we did detect a significant change in the fish communities using catch per unit effort um, comparisons. Uh, Simper pulled out, obviously, like I said, the green sunfish just rose right to the top and changed in these communities. Uh, some other increases were blue, uh, bluegill sunfish also increased. Uh, darters and log perch nearly fell off the map. Uh, pikes, interestingly, also had an increase, uh, which could, could have just been timing and flood stage, stuff like that, spawning, because I did get a lot of juveniles. But uh, like I said, brown goby even makes this, this list here. So. Multivariate MDMS plots. You could you can cut this this graph in half and uh, give one half to Scott Wells, and the other half to me because there's no overlap um, in our sampling days. Uh, these are individual sampling runs of 15 minute uh, power on electroshocking. And they just completely pull right out. Again, the the differences are. There we go. Uh, the Pumas cyanellus, green sunfish, um, darters, northern sunfish, the Pumas beltastes, uh, non native suprinids, all pulled out to Scott Wells in 2005. Um, so, pretty marked difference. At least it tells us it has significantly changed um, as a master's thesis project. At least I have a significant difference. Um, mostly this is attributed to the green sunfish changes, some other shifts, um, pretty much mentioned there's a new uh, non-native spread of white perch into there. Um, Atoms disappeared. Um, native suprinids decreased as well. So unfortunately this location does not seem suitable 
or northern sunfish, at least right now. Um, it's a very large watershed, and my area is literally the mouth of it. So it will take a lot of thinking, and you guys, <laughs> if you want to start looking at habitat and stuff, but at least this specific area, um, you know, can't support or we can't detect northern sunfish there. Future efforts, I suggest look for spots without green sunfish. Something about green sunfish, they're extremely prolific in this area. Um, they're pretty aggressive if you watch them in an aquarium. Um, and around gobies, uh, they're, they're an easy scapegoat, but I don't think they're innocent in this, um, this story here. Stocking should continue with maybe a little more regimented, planned out, um, you know, kind of a schedule, which I think we'll be talking about later today, maybe, I hope. So, on to the hybridization part. This is the, the fun, the nitty gritty here. Um, if anybody's worked with Lepomis, that was a total head scratcher. What, <laughs> what hole, where did this thing crawl out of? What, what animal <laughs> dropped it out of the sky? Um, and some of you may recognize Jim Haynes over there. Assistance. Thank you very much. Um, so, some quick background on the Pomus hybridization. Um, it is an old um, study going back to the 30s with Hubs and some really big names. I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, Sunfish are an interesting model for hybridization and speciation in general. Speci speciation. Um, some findings in the past are. Lacomas hybridization increases with, um, you know, super heavy dominance by one species. Uh, habitats are degraded, or when a new species is introduced to an area, uh, which is kind of all three of what's going on. Although there's an interesting twist at the end here. So sunfish also nest in colonies, um, sometimes interspecies colonies. They'll uh, nest together. Uh, especially when the habitat is limited. And um, there's some very interesting alternative mating tactics within sunfish. Um, why is that coming up? I think it's strange. Okay, such as cuckolding. Um, males intrude on a nesting pair where a male has fair and square quartered a female. They're nesting. And that guy back there just sneaks right in. And he was even colored as a female so that other males don't, you know, give him aggression and stuff. It's, there's some really interesting, strange stuff. Um, I wish I had a little, you know, mini submersible to go down into Tanawana Creek and see if this is perhaps what's going on. Um, so, like I said, they're sneaker males, they fertilize, they run away, and this has especially been observed by bluegills. And, which brings me over to the next point, So, as I mentioned, I had several really strange head scratching um, specimens. And uh, so I developed a key in, in collusion with Doug. We, uh, we pulled out, you know, metrics and I, I looked up some, some detailed descriptions of the Homo species. Um, and uh, so with these specimens that I captured, I kept them live. I uh, had them professionally photographed in the flesh, not by myself, so I can't take credit for the beautiful pictures you guys will be seeing here. Froze them, uh, we sent DNA samples to a private um, company to have them analyzed, and then gave them back to the museum. <coughs> gave them to the museum. Um, so this is the key. Um, nice nitty gritty, I'm not even going to point at it, but the level of detail uh, you sometimes have to go into while you're in the field holding a fish and say, what in the heck is this? And it can't fall into any of those columns. Well, you throw it in the line bowl and bring it back. Um, so, like I said, we used DNA analysis, microsatellite techniques, um, we did mitochondrial, as well as genomic, um, um, so 27 specimens, um, got received the DNA analysis 
Of them, eight of them uh, were bluegill by northern sunfish hybrids. Totally, totally, you know, blew us away. <laughs> Our suspicions were correct, basically. Um, made us very pleased to see that we're not crazy and the key might still work. Um, so several other hybrid crosses were pulled out of these specimens um, in the juvenile life sizes. These are probably one-year-old um, fish or young in the year, possibly. Um, here's the crosses. So northern by bluegill made this guy. Bluegill by pumpkin seed, pumpkin to green, green to bluegill. Northern's only hybridized with bluegills. Bluegills were always the male parent in these other crosses. Um, so interesting one-way techniques, unidirectional hybridization also. And as you can see in the small form, these fish are all kind of indistinguishable, at least at a quick glance, especially if you're in the field. They get a little bit larger, you start seeing traits of their parents. So this guy has that upward angled ear flap of you know, an adult male long ear, or northern, I'm sorry, I keep mixing that up. Um, they're actually even sometimes gritty. Uh, the green pumpkin seed cross down here was in full bright coloration. Um, this, this guy unfortunately got pickled. Um, <laughs> so, no DNA off of him, unfortunately, but uh, it's a very large specimen with a very long, probably angled ear. So, some future work. Um, species was scarce in the presence of overbearingly dominant other Lipoma species. Remain some questions. Why only these crosses? Why were they all unidirectional? Um, bluegills definitely seem to dominate the hybrid population, if you want to call it that. Um, is it due to these, these alternative mating techniques? Um, so, so remaining research is going to be, is going on. Uh, by the State Museum guys, Brian and Jeremy, um, are going through our specimens. Pure, um, pure species, as well as these hybrids, some of them could be proof by DNA uh, analysis, so uh, we're doing morphometric analysis and stuff like that, um, which we can use as to develop a more detailed technique um, to help identify unknown hybrids for now and in the future. I'd just like to thank Doug Carlson and Scott Wells, um, as well as a whole slew of people, and including Tim DePriest, if he's in here too. So, thank you. I think we'll hold off on questions just to try to keep things moving, but um, probably catch David at the break if you have questions. Thank you. Obviously, just better understand 
the fish communities of the past and present within these tributaries. And this ended up being kind of a two-part study. Uh, the first part was analyzing the historic data set that was collected by Albert Haynes and Wright in the early 1900s. Uh, the second part was then <coughs> comparing Wright's data to a data set that I then collected <coughs> present from the same, very same tributaries, which is a unique opportunity. Um, so Wright's study was intended to be published as a peer-reviewed article in a museum, New York State Museum Bulletin in the 1920s. Uh, this publication never happened, and it wasn't until Robert Daniels rediscovered the manuscript and the printing plates and everything that was there for this to be printed, and was finally able to get Wright's study published uh, posthumously in 2006 in Guelph Ideology Reviews. Daniels also published a companion article <coughs> along with Wright's article describing the process of finding it and, uh, and getting it then ready to actually get, be published presently. So Wright surveyed uh, 10 Lake Ontario streams, the five tributaries we talked about before, and then five tributaries of those tributaries. And what made his study rather unique for his time period was that he compared the, he, he reported the fish that he found, of course, along with the habitat, the various physical habitat parameters that he found those fish in. Uh, stream depth, width, elevation, and substrate. He then chose to display his data in very unique, uh, but elegant and rather busy looking graphical analysis. This is an example of one of Wright's stream graphs. And, uh, this is always the part that kills me for time, but I'll try and run you through it real quick just so you know what we're looking at here. Let's get down. We have the big part up top is the species field. The left hand margin indicates the source of the stream, or excuse me, the mouth of the stream. The right hand margin indicating the, the, the source of the stream. And he has that broken down by river mile. Down the the left margin here are all the species that Wright found. And they are indicated as to where in the stream he found those species by these dark bars coming out laterally here. Across the top of the graph are the various substrates he found within the course of the stream. Again, broken down by river mile. And down below it, all the various uh, stream flow conditions that he found within the stream, again, by river mile. Within the species field itself are two more graphs, these two line graphs. The top one indicates the stream depth throughout the course of the stream, and that's graduated out in feet down the right-hand margin of the, of the paper. And the lower one is elevation, again graduated out in feet. Below that we have the various unique habitat types you found along the way, uh, the wetlands, as well as any tributaries, bridges, dams, etc. Uh, he also has below that the stream width, again graduated out in feet. And this is the fun one. This is the cross-sectional view of the valley floor. This is one where you have to kind of put your head to the side and pretend that you're standing in the middle of the stream and imagine that you can see the valley floor going out beside you. So with this graphical analysis, I wanted to perform a modern statistical analysis on Wright's data as a basis, as a, as a way of comparing the, uh, my future study, as well as looking at, as well as comparing the, uh, I don't want to say the validity, but the accuracy of Wright's interpretations also. So what I did was to extract the data that I needed, the, being the fish data and the habitat types, using a presence or absence methodology from uh, Wright's graphical analysis. Uh, with that, I then removed the rarest occurrences of fish as well as habitat types 
just to prevent these the extremely rare species and habitats from skewing the data at all. And then performed a canonical correspondence analysis on Wright's data set and compared Wright's interpretations of his graphical analysis of his data to my interpretations of the CCA analysis of his data. So this is the ordination diagram, the output from the CCA. Uh, the fish in blue, the species in blue are the fish that were a good match between uh, my interpretations and Wright's interpretations. The species in orange are the species that were of at least a moderate match between the two. And overall I had about 87, better than 87% of the fish were a good match. And you add that together, that 97% of the fish were at least a partial match, which was good. And then real quick to run you through how to read one of these guys. Uh, we have all the habitat parameters emerging from the focus of the axes as vectors. The vectors, the longer the vector, the longer the vector, the more influential that habitat type is on the distribution of the species. And all of the vect vectors indicate increasing value as you move out. So for example, river mile down here, as you travel out this vector, you're increasing in river mile. So the fish located near the end of this vector, are, these are going to be your upper course fish. And conversely, if you were to travel in the opposite direction, then you're moving downstream and towards your lower course fish. And logically, as you would expect, opposed to river mile are your deepest and widest portions of the stream, the ones that are farthest downstream, closest to the mouth of the stream. The, the species themselves are plotted as points at the centroid of their habitat associations. Species that are plotted close to one another are species that were often found together. Uh, these are essentially your communities. So from, from here with Wright's data, I was then able to kind of reverse engineer a, a study design to match what would have likely been Wright's methodology. So I stuck to using seine nets and dip nets to collect my fish. I then pared down both data sets again because Wright surveyed 10 streams, I surveyed five of those, so I had to be sure that we were using the the same segments and the same streams for comparison. I then performed a canonical correspondence again on both data sets as they had been uh, paired to one another and compared the results. So this is Wright's data set after uh, being paired with mine, so this is the same five streams that I surveyed. <coughs> uh, in this case now we have bluefish being species that are in common between my CCA analysis Right CCA analysis. The redfish are fish that appear on, this is right CCA, so the redfish are fish that appear on rights analysis and not on mine. The, uh, the caveat to that is that the fish with the asterisks next to them are fish that I did find, I just did not find them often enough to include them in the CCA analysis. So now I have the, the communities, the various communities, with the large communities circled in red. Uh, we have, if you find River Mile, is down here. So here is our upper course community. Um, Mud Minnow, part of the upper course community, but aptly named. We have our mid course community, which is also kind of our cosmopolitan species. Uh, the ones that are you know, tolerant of a wide variety of conditions. And so they could be found in the, in the upper course or the lower course. So the CCA tends to put them towards the middle of the graph. And we have two large lower course communities that appear to be separated largely by street flow conditions and muddy substrate. So we fast forward 100 years, these are the, the CCA output from, from mine, again the fish in blue 
of the fish are in common. The fish in red are now fish that Wright did not encounter in his survey. And when we circle the communities, uh, some of the differences begin to pop out. We have a much smaller, so now River Mile is up here. Uh, and every time you change the data set and rerun the CCA, things are positioned slightly different. Although if you look, River Mile is still opposite max stop to max width, so that stream gradient is there, which is a good indication that this still is logical and makes sense. Uh, so we have a much smaller upstream community, or upper course community, a large mid-course community that appears to be showing some separation, uh, again along the, uh, but this time along the sub uh, substrate difference, uh, vegetation being the primary driver there, or a mixed substrate. And now we only have one downstream or lower course community, so it appears that we've just essentially lost an entire community of fish. Uh, so while many of the fish that made up that lower community before are still present, um, due to the many changes that have taken place to these streams, the physical condition of these streams over the last century, uh, you know, things like the expansion of agriculture in the west, urban suburban sprawl from the city of Rochester in the east, uh, the expansion of the Erie Canal and the construction of Highway 531 to the south. Many of the fish have been redistributed. Uh, Wright described these streams as being very uniform from source to mouth. Uh, they really seem to follow the idea of a stream continuum. However, the streams that I encountered were anything but. They were very irregular uh, and disjointed. You know, if you just looked at, at the stream flow, you know, my stream flow patterns were just all over the place. So the fish have been redistributed thusly and, and essentially we've lost an entire community. <clears throat> so if we, if we change our focus a little bit and go from the community level down to the species level and focus, again, we're with Bright's data now, just to be sure, and focus on the, uh, these four species circle in red. We have black nose dace and brooks stickleback, which are holding closely to river mile. Uh, mud minnow, which is still an upper course fish with those two guys, but again, aptly named, holding to the muddy areas. And largemouth bass is our representative here for the downstream spiny ray fishes, uh, holding to the deepest waters furthest downstream. And again, Wright in his paper describes most of these streams as being well separated in terms of the spiny ray fish staying down below the ridge and the, min the minnows being upstream below the ridge. So again, we fast forward 100 years, look at the same four species. Now we have black nose dace still holding the river mile, but the brook stickleback and the mud meadow appear to have moved further downstream and are now holding strongly the vegetation. Uh, which is a big difference, especially for mud minnow, since if he was holding with mud, he should be up here somewhere. And the largemouth bass has it moved upstream slightly and closer to the vegetation. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Some of the possible driving factors behind this seem to be tied in with possibly the construction of, of Highway 531 as it, I have found, you know, in my, in my surveys I found largemouth bass, pumpkin seed, bluegill, all in the very upper stretches of some of these streams, places that they historically hadn't been a hundred years ago. And so now you have a new predatory fish upstream swimming around with minnows, and as a result, it appears you know, we have a situation where brook stickleback and mud minnow are essentially seeking cover and finding the, the more healthy vegetated <coughs> locations. Uh, possible avenues for this to happen, uh, when they constructed Highway 531, they put in a number of retention ponds for at least two of these streams now, Brown Pond and Brown Pond Creek and Northrop Creek. 
these ponds serve, excuse me, Larkin Creek and Northern Creek, these ponds serve as the primary sources for these, for these streams, especially during the wettest periods of the year. And as well, Northern Creek and Salmon Creek have direct tie-ins to the Erie Canal. And from interviewing and speaking with fishermen along that stretch of the canal, they regularly reported having caught those species of pumpkin seed, largemouth bass, in the water canal there. So, to kind of summarize this real quick, uh, Wright was right in terms of uh, his descriptive analysis matched well with my analysis of the CCA of his data. Uh, his descriptive analysis also matched well to our current understanding of these fish to begin with. These streams have certainly been greatly altered over the last hundred years. And this seems to have disrupted the stream continuum uh, to a great deal and redistributed fish, resulting in the loss of at least one fish community overall, as well as various changes uh, in the individual species habitat associations and then their association with each other. <coughs>
So the difference between the historic survey and the new survey is that the new survey is set up to collect data from all the lake habitats in depths ranging from 6 meters to 225 meters. And to expand understanding of the areas in the depths where invasive species such as round goby have settled and those preferred by native species such as the deepwater sculpin. Other physical data, including temperature, clarity, and available nutrients, will add to the bigger picture of how Lake Ontario is changing over time. This figure depicts the proportion of lake area by depth and the corresponding proportion of all historical trawling sites. Uh, the shallower depths, as you can see in uh, the gray and black, uh, were sampled at a much higher rate than accurately represented the system, while depths greater than 150 meters were not able to be sampled. Um, at the time, the capability to sample these depths was simply not available. The new survey is designed to more accurately reflect the depth portions of Lake Ontario, and as you can see, the deeper depths are now able to be incorporated into the design thanks to new, more advanced trawling gear. Uh, looking in a spatial sense, the survey as it existed prior to 2015 was limited to six transects, two on the south shore of the Mississauga and four in the Rochester Basin. Um, so we had a total of 55 historical trawling sites. In uh, 2015, we expanded the survey, as you can see here in red, to 19 transects, so we totaled 135 trawl sites. So we um, really tried to expand that survey to more adequately sample the available lake habitats. The undertaking was made possible through a collaborative effort between the New York DEC, uh, we sampled uh, primarily in the Eastern Basin over, over here in uh, purple, um, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in the light blue, and USGS, which culminated in the first lake-wide survey since 1972. Uh, in previous studies, the southern shore of Lake Ontario has been found to be more highly populated with dry-seated mussels. So I just started about five months ago, and I hadn't any experience eating fish in freshwater systems in the north. So the joke was, you know, they asked me, can I separate silverfish from groundfish from dry-seated mussels? I'm like, okay, great, this sounds wonderful. I can get this no problem. So as you can see from these photos, uh, lots and lots of dry seeds, few silverfish, brownfish thrown in there, life's pretty good. Well, then we went out into the west. So here, this is a site in Hamilton, which is our furthest western point, and this is 15 meters. We had the normal catch of alewife, rainbow smell, brown goby. Um, this catch, although it's not represented in this photo, did have some dry seeded mussels in it as well. And a whole bunch of more species that I, I had no idea what they were. Uh, so, uh, we got more um, gizzard shad, emerald shiner, spot-tailed shiner, yellow perch, white perch, lake white fish, round white fish. So uh, my little learning curve was suddenly unexpected and uh, very steep. Um, again, in the West, specifically Toronto this time, we untangled an assortment of fish, including three spine sticklebacks from masses of macrophytes. And in the catch, we saw more lake white fish and more round white fish. So this had me thinking, do species richness and diversity differ in distinct geographical areas of the lake? So first we looked at the diversity of the new sites using the Shannon Index and compared that to the historical sites. You can see quite a difference in there. These uh, new sites definitely had much higher uh, species diversity. So using the new data, the whole lake diversity was recalculated and we ended up with a much higher average at um, 1.37 from our historical plot of 0.97. Further spatial breakdown of species richness into basins, we see that species richness is greatest in the eastern basin, followed by the Niagara. So we've got uh, greater species richness on the furthest west basin and in the furthest east basin. Um, all these transects are part of our new sampling design. So the Rochester Basin, which is the third from the left, uh, is slightly less, and the Mississauga, of course, as you can see quite clearly, has the least amount of species richness. All right. So there's species richness. Let's go back to species diversity. Um, this is where things get interesting. The Niagara and the Eastern Basins have the highest species diversity but have very different bathymetric profiles. The Eastern Basin is primarily shallow, as denoted by you know, the red orange coloring up here in the right. And over here in the Niagara Basin, the depth profile is deeper. So, as I said earlier, the Rochester Basin has the deepest, uh, is the deepest basin out of these four, but it has lower species diversity although not as low as the Mississauga here, with the 1.08 being our lowest species diversity. So there's no obvious trends uh, related to depth. So then we thought, let's look at temperature. 
So checking out the average temperature gradient, we see that the Niagara Basin has a north to south uh, increasing temperature gradient over the smallest area, and that the Eastern Basin has by far the highest average temperature. Uh, the Rochester and the Mississauga have relatively concentric uh, temperature gradients. Again, no obvious trends stand out. So, you know, I just started kind of looking at our data. And uh, so what did we see at these new transection sites that made such a difference in species diversity? So these are the top 10 of the largest differences in number of individuals per species caught. The historic sites are on the left, and the, uh, our new sites are on the right. So all but one of these species show a higher number of individuals caught at the new sites. Our oddball in this top 10 list is alewife, right here at the top, where we caught almost six times less alewife at the new transects as we did uh, in the historic sites of transects, which brings us to the main question of why. So the western and eastern basins have shallower average depth, but the Rochester Basin, again, is the deepest and has a higher diversity in species richness than the shallower Mississauga. The temperature map indicated that the Niagara Basin has a much greater range of temperature than the Eastern Basin, but species diversity were the same. So other future directions that we might look at, um, focus on availability of nutrients, uh, water clarity, the idea that higher areas of embayments in the Niagara and Eastern Basins may contain more diverse habitat, or the idea that inlets on the west and outlets in the east make for excellent species corridors which increase diversity and species richness in these eastern and western basins. All right, so looking at single species implications, we're back to our round goby and our slimy sculpin and deep water sculpins. <coughs> so, uh, the, so the densities of round goby at the historic site versus the new sites show relatively little change with a very slight increase in density, as you can see at this uh, one site up here. Um, but these new sites that showed higher density, they weren't quite enough to affect um, the general trend. Similarly, with the slimy sculpin, we see again just a slight increase in density in these uh, new sites as opposed to the historic sites, <coughs> but again, not enough to impact really the general trend. Uh, deep water sculpin's density was most impacted by these new sites. The density increased by an entire order of magnitude, which begs the question, is deep water sculpin population recovering, or did the expansion of the survey allow us to better target the deep water sculpin habitat? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to better understand the habitat occupied by deep water sculpin, we looked at presence absence data. This uh, dotted line right here represents the 100 meter bathymetric contour line. So deep water sculpin were caught on both sides of the 100 meter line at all of the deepest tall sites. As we'll point out up here in the eastern basin, they were caught as well, even though the eastern basin is by far, you know, has all that shallow area. Uh, refining this data a little bit, the highest densities were found towards the deepest part of the basin, with the exception of that one eastern site in the upper right hand corner. <coughs> um, and so, in the, at the end of the day, we added new deep trawl sites in our historic transects and 13 entirely new transects for a total of 70 new trawl sites. All for what? <laughs> We found species diversity is higher than we thought it could be for the entire lake, with the highest diversity in the Niagara and Eastern Basins. Um, this can be useful when looking at other Laurentian Great Lakes systems for trends and possibly predicting how Ontario will continue to change. Uh, the invasive brown goby has settled into its niche and seems to occupy the same habitat at consistent densities throughout the entire lake. Uh, slimy sculpins as well, uh, their densities and biomass are consistent uh, lake-wide. Deep water sculpins were a surprise in our extended survey. Uh, they are more numerous and exhibit higher density and biomass at the new deep, deep sites at the historic transects and in the new transects as well. So, and now we can track changes on phys in physical gradients on a more comprehensive level. This lake-wide study will allow trends and changes to be observed on a much finer scale. I want to thank our partners at the New York DEC and the Ontario Ministry for Natural Resources and Forestry for making this comprehensive survey possible and express my gratitude to the biologists, vessel staff, the techs and all the other uh, folks and faculty at the Lake Ontario Biological Station for helping me, me this fall and introducing me to the waters of New York. Thank you. Time for questions. No questions. 
are you planning to repeat these annually? I do believe that is the plan for the next three years, I believe. a little break so uh, we stay on time for those that might be wanting to. Um. All right, we're going to get started here again. Everyone can take their seats. Our next speaker is Justin Dorado, a um, master's student at SUNY ESF, and he's going to talk to us today about the Atlantic Salmon Restoration in Central New York. So what I'm going to be learning and talking about this morning is uh, most of the results that I found in my second year of work. So before I get started talking about my project, I wanted to give a quick background on Atlantic salmon. Uh, Atlantic salmon are native to the Lake Ontario watershed, and they were found in many of our tributaries here in central New York. Uh, we've primarily been working in this area here. Uh, but the original strain that lived in Lake Ontario would run uh, our tributaries in the fall, and it was this, at this time that they created a or uh, it created a, a great food source for the Native Americans that lived here. And that transitioned into a great food source for the European settlers during expansion. But as we know, uh, a lot of the offshoots from expansion, pollution, damming of our tributaries, this eventually uh, led to a decline in the original Atlantic salmon population and uh, eventually their extirpation from the watershed by 1900. And so it's been since this time that there's been a number of organizations that have attempted to restore uh, the, the species in the watershed, and uh, until recently, most of these results have been fairly, fairly limited. So why do we want to restore Atlantic salmon in the first place? Well, I think we have an inherent obligation to at least try. It is a native top predator to the watershed. It's really a charismatic species. What's interesting about Atlantic salmon as well is that they can tolerate warmer water temperatures than most of our Pacific salmonids, which have lar largely come to replace Atlantic salmon as far as filling the ecological niche that they used to uh, inhibit and inhabit. And also, Atlantic salmon are a hugely popular sport fish, so it would bring quite a bit of economic uh, benefit to the area here. And uh, I know both of these guys, so. <laughs> so that's kind of the underlying tone for my research here. So what I wanted to do was look at a couple different strains of salmon that are currently being considered for restoration efforts here. I also wanted to look at the abiotic habitat in our tributaries. Obviously, our streams are a lot different today than they were 100 years ago when the original Atlantic salmon strain was extirpated. So can the habitat still support them today? And at the same time, I wanted to look at migration barriers in our regional tributaries. Migration barriers were one of the main reasons why Atlantic salmon were excavated in the first place. Uh, obviously, being a migratory sport fish, uh, some wanted these need to move between lake and tributary environments to complete their life cycles. So I wanted to see if migration potential is still here. So from these objectives, I developed two hypotheses to test. The first was that there would be no physiological differences between strains of salmon, uh, and that pertains to their survival and growth rates. The second hypothesis I tested was that habitat suitability, suitability and accessibility in subregions in central New York would not be any different. So first, talking about the strains that I was working with. Uh, our first strain comes from Lake Memphis Magog in northern Vermont. I'm going to refer to this as the Magog strain from here on out. Uh, but this particular strain is known to be able to survive pretty high water temperatures in tributaries of Lake Mount Magog, in that are uh, approaching 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, so with what we think climate change is going to do to our streams here in central New York, if we can find a strain that has maybe already adapted to warmer water temperatures, that may bode well for restoration potential. At the same time, my advisor, Dr. Margaret Murphy, she found this particular strain had high survival and growth rates when she evaluated them in central New York. The second strain I was working with is coming from Sebago Lake. Uh, this particular strain is pretty widely stocked throughout the Northeast U.S. It's a very available, a lot of hatcheries are producing it. And this is also the strain that has shown to uh, have the best performance in Lake Champlain in terms of adult returns to original stocking tributaries. So it's these characteristics that make these strains interesting for our work. So I mentioned uh, I was doing my work in a couple different sub-regions in Central New York. The first is called the Ontario Drumlins. These are small direct, tri direct tributaries to Lake Ontario, uh, found west of the city of Oswego. And so we have three streams here, which were Rice, Eight Mile, and Little Creeks. 
The second region that I was working in was the Fish Creek region. Fish Creek is a major uh, source tributary to Oneida Lake, and uh, I had three <coughs> additional tributaries here, which were Mad River, Furnace Creek, and Point Rock Creek. And so we know that Atlantic salmon historically used both of these watersheds, which is one of the primary factors that I looked at each of the sub-watersheds. Um, now there is some differences between each of these regions. For example, the Drumlins does have a higher proportion of urbanization and agriculture. The Fish Creek region, uh, more heavily forested. Being on the Tug Hill Plateau, we see a lot more precipitation throughout the year. So there is some regional differences. Um, now, in each of the, uh, the points in these streams, it's probably hard to see in the back, but these uh, the little black points are where uh, we were stocking out both of the strains of salmon and evaluating their growth, uh, and as well as looking at habitat here. So, talking a little bit more about that, what I wanted to do was look at the survival and growth of each of these strains. We think that a strain of fish that has uh, higher survival and growth rates is going to offer more potential for restoration. So I adopted this study design here, where we had stocked both strains of our fish in a 100 meters uh, stretch of all of our streams. Uh, I tried to do a start, uh, target stocking density of one fish per square meter. Uh, we did have uh, public fin clips on all of our Magog stream fish. That way, uh, we had stocked them in the, the early summer, when we went back in the late summer to do our uh, electroshocking surveys. If we had caught both strains, we would be able to tell the difference between them. So uh, we used multi-pass depletion uh, electroshocking to sample for these fish. Uh, from that, I was able to estimate survival and look at growth rates. And as far as growth rates go, I wanted to look at two different metrics here. First, I wanted to look at growth in weight using the standardized mass-specific growth rate, and growth in length using the absolute growth in length metric. And I wanted to look at both of these because uh, the two strains that we were working with, I had to stock them out at different sizes just because of uh, the rearing conditions uh, from the hatcheries that we received them from. And so I needed to decouple the relationship between length and weight because fish tend to grow at different rates depending on what characteristic you're looking at. So this was kind of a way to validate is one strain really growing faster than the other if we're seeing uh, significantly faster growth in both of these different characteristics. Also, like I mentioned, at each of the uh, locations that we had stocked our fish out at, I was looking at some of the habitat and barriers in, in each of these tributaries. So for habitat, I was looking at abiotic habitat characteristics, and I evaluated that with the Habitat Suitability Index developed by Stanley and Trio. Uh, for our barriers, I kind of, I have developed my own migration barrier index, is what I've been calling it, to look at certain hydrologic and geomorphic characteristics of our barriers. So first, the Habitat Suitability Index. This considers 17 environmental characteristics that are known to influence Atlantic salmon survival and productivity in tributaries. So things from water temperature to substrate, velocity, everything like that. And so it scores, scores that habitat based on what we know about Atlantic salmon habitat preferences. For the Migration Barrier Index, the Vermont, Nation, Vermont uh, Agency of Natural Resources had developed a protocol to assess migration barriers. Uh, again, for geomorphic and hydrologic characteristics. So I had taken those methods and applied it to our barriers and the tributaries that we had been working in. And then I looked at the methods from Michael Ketal, who used the same protocol in tributaries of Lake Champlain, to evaluate uh, migration barriers for brook trout. And so I came up with a, a pretty similar index to look at our migration potential here in central New York for Atlantic salmon. So moving to our first results here, this is growth in weight. And so all the results that I'm going to talk about from here on out are largely from 2015. So we have our mango strain fish uh, in our gray bars here, the Sebago strain fish in the white bars. And I had split this graph in half, with our three streams on the left being the three drumlin streams we studied in 2015. And so what we were seeing was that this mango strain fish was growing significantly faster in terms of weight, which was pretty interesting. That was, that was unanimous across those three streams. When you compare that with what we saw in the fish in the fish creek tributaries, our growth rates were much more similar. And we actually had the Sebago strain growing a little bit faster in Point Rock Creek. So that was an interesting result. And so I was able to validate that with growth in length, where we're seeing a really similar result here. Magog strain fish are still growing faster in the drumlins. We actually have Sebago strain fish growing significantly faster in Point Rock Creek now. And so the most interesting thing that I got out of this part of the work was that we have one strain growing faster in one watershed, the other strain growing faster in the other watershed. And so we needed to figure out why is this going on. So like most salmonids, I think a lot of that is dictated by temperature. And so what we were seeing is that our drumlin streams had a lot of warmer temperature profiles in our Fish Creek tributaries. Now these are the average uh, temperature profiles from the summer. Um, 
and the drumlin streams were always warmer than our Fish Creek tributaries. Now, like I mentioned earlier, what's interesting about Atlantic salmon is they can tolerate warmer water temperatures. 19 degrees Celsius is the optimum water temperature for juvenile Atlantic salmon. And so we're seeing that our Fish Creek tributaries, on average, may be slightly cooler than what Atlantic salmon would prefer. Our drumlin streams are slightly warmer than what optimum temperature would, would dictate. But what was important that we found here is that our drumlin streams never reached lethal temperature levels for salmon. We were always finding salmon at the locations we had stocked them out at. Now, for reference here, this is 17 degrees Celsius. This is the optimum temperature for juvenile rainbow trout. And like many of us know, rainbow trout have largely become established in a lot of the tributaries that Atlantic salmon used to use, primarily in the Ontario watershed. And so what we're seeing here is that each of the study regions we're working in are warmer than what rainbow trout would prefer, again, the drumlins in particular. So what's interesting here is that a lot of our Pacific salmonids might not be able to reach our maximum production potential in these warmer drumlins tributaries. That may create a niche habitat where we can go and look at Atlantic salmon as they can tolerate those warmer temperatures. And I'll come back to that a little bit later here. So that was just temperature. Now when we looked at the rest of the habitat here, we did find suitable habitat in terms of just about everything in both of our watersheds. But Fish Creek did have a slight advantage in that the habitat was slightly more suitable for juvenile Atlantic salmon. Again, that's not to say that the drumlins didn't offer some uh, suitable habitat because they definitely did. Um, but overall, Fish Creek was slightly more suitable. So that's our habitat suitability. And now I'm going to transition to habitat accessibility. Again, Atlantic salmon are migratory fish. They need to complete part of their lives in lake environments, like Ontario, for example, and spawn in tributaries, typically. So this is a stream that was located in Rice Creek, one of our study streams. And it was removed in 2013 by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to bring the stream back to a more natural state and to promote fish migration here. So this is pre-restoration, and this is what it looks like today. And so unfortunately, I had started this project after the dam was already removed, so I didn't have before and after data to compare with here. But we did have uh, study sites both above and below this dam. And in the foreground here, that was part of one of our study sites, and this is where we saw some of our highest, highest Atlantic salmon growth and survival. And so I bring that up because we're starting to see a lot of these dams being removed for various purposes. A lot of them were installed 50, 75, 100 years ago for various purposes. And they're no longer serving those purposes. A lot of these dams are coming up for relicensing, and they're not being relicensed, so they're being removed. Well, that is opening up a lot of uh, tributary habitat for what could potentially be Atlantic salmon habitat. So I think as these dams are coming out and barriers are being removed, that may increase restoration potential here. <clears throat> so what we had done is looked at the hydrologic and geomorphic characteristics of all the barriers in each of our streams to see if a migrating adult Atlantic salmon could move from a lake environment to tributary habitat. I wanted to do that because restoration of Atlantic salmon, in my mind, connotates a sense that the species needs to be able to naturally reproduce to consider it a, a restored population. So what we found is that in the Drumlin's tributaries, again, these are smaller, jet, relatively small tributaries here, and the migration barriers tended to be smaller uh, on average as well. So in the three streams that we looked at, there was at least one barrier that would limit Atlantic salmon migration to some extent. But at the same time, I think in the, under the right uh, circumstances, high flow events for example, fish would be able to migrate to the upper stretches of some of these tributaries where there is really good spawning habitat. We compared that with what we found in the Fish Creek watershed and these streams tend to be a little bit larger and there is uh, in turn larger barriers here. So we have some significant dams that are definitely going to inhibit Atlantic salmon migration to some of the best uh, habitat. Point Rock Creek for example, there's a major dam between Oneida Lake in Point Rock Creek that would limit Atlantic salmon from reaching uh, that tributary for spawning purposes. Unfortunately, that happened to be our best stream in terms of habitat where our salmon did the best overall. So kind of a, an interesting uh, disparity there between regions. So to kind of bring that, this all back together here, what we were finding from our streams is that it seems like that Magog strain can survive warmer temperatures. Whether they had adapted that, or adapted to those conditions and tributaries that led them from Magog, that may be the case. Uh, again, as in terms of what we expect climate change to do to our streams here in central New York, if we can already identify a strain that can survive these warmer water temperatures, that may give us a leg up in terms of restoration potential. I didn't talk too much about survival because unfortunately our Sebago strain, we didn't have enough fry to stock them out at one fish per square meter like I had intended. 
And so what I think we were seeing was some density dependent uh, results in terms of survival and growth. But results did indicate that survival was slightly higher in the Sebago strain. And there's other studies that do support this as well, that the Sebago strain is a, a, a likely candidate for restoration. Going back to our habitat here, we're seeing better habitat in Fish Creek, one of those historic Atlantic salmon regions here. But if adults can no longer reach some of those uh, uh, key habitats here, restoring a population there is going to be very difficult. Where we look at the drumlins here, accessibility is going to be a little bit better here. Unfortunately, the habitat in some cases might be less uh, optimal uh, or suboptimal, but I think conditions are still going to allow Atlantic salmon to exist in some of these tributaries especially these warmer tributaries where Pacific salmon cannot uh, do well in. We did see some evidence of adults and spawning in our drumlet tributaries, but we didn't find any natural reproduction. We didn't find any juveniles there. So it may be that these streams are limiting our Pacific salmon in production potential. And that may be uh, an opportunity to look at Atlantic salmon restoration. So what does all this mean in terms of restoration potential here? Well, as I mentioned, until recently, uh, results for Atlantic salmon restoration have been pretty limited. But we're starting to see some really, really fascinating results with the USGS's work in the Salmon River, the Bring Back the Salmon Initiative on the North Shore of tributaries, where we're having adults returning to stocking tributaries, and we do have uh, significant evidence that spawning natural reproduction is going on here. So I think if we can expand some of these study areas and look at something like a drumlins tributary where there's a current void in the niche habitat here, that might open up our uh, Atlantic salmon restoration potential even more. So I think uh, restoration for Atlantic salmon is going to continue to trend upwards, especially as there's renewed interest in restoring the species here. Um, again, there's a, a multitude of reasons why we would want to bring the species back into the watershed. And so I, I think the prospect is really good. And so with that, I want to thank uh, everybody that was involved in this project. Uh, my funding source is ESF and the New York Sea Grant. Uh, from everybody at the DEC that provided our licenses and permits to do our field work, I really, really appreciate it. And then the Vermont Fish and Wildlife, Fish Creek Atlantic Salmon Club, and Morrisville State College who provided our salmon resources, reared the salmon for us, and, and really gave a lot of logistical support. So with that, and thank you to everybody for coming out. It was a great turnout, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions.
but they pulled an adult Atlantic salmon out of there. Now, why would a fish be in there as opposed to going back to a stream that had been stocked? Um, one of the things that I think gets lost in my message a lot of the time is that the work that we've been doing hasn't been so much to restore the species itself in terms of putting hundreds of thousands or millions of fish into the streams. Um, so it would be really interesting if I had a couple more years to go back to our tributaries that we stocked and, and tried to see if our fish are coming back. Um, but if I'm around still, though, I would definitely like to check that out. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Obviously, we've got natural reproduction going on in the Salmon River system. Uh, I, I would argue that you ought to be using whatever information you gather there as sort of your baseline then to look on your tributary evaluation that you're doing. In other words, super moles on the food section you have, put the Salmon River in, but you know that it's happening. That's the good news. The bad news is that it's confounded all the all over the place because you've got Pacific salmon and steelhead, which are obviously going to have a big impact on what happens to that natural Atlantic sea. Right, yeah, that's, that's a good question and a good point there. Um, so the USGS guys, they can tell you a lot more about the project, but they have been using primarily the Sebago strain, again, one that, that we looked at here. And so part of the reason why we chose the Drumlin streams is because unlike the Salmon River, which is really well known for being a Pacific Salmonid fishery, Pacific salmon aren't being stocked into these drumlins tributaries. Again, maybe because these streams are too warm to support them. And so that, that's why we wanted to look at those streams. If there isn't a niche that's currently being filled by Pacific salmon, that may give Atlantic salmon restoration a leg up. So that's why we, we had considered those streams. But yeah, you are right. We want to be we want to be looking at the results that the USGS is finding, and again, what the Bring Back the Salmon Initiative is finding on the North Shore, because they're doing a lot of interesting work with strains up there as well. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens here in the next five or ten years with Atlantic salmon restoration. Is that Thanks, it? Justin. Yes, right. thank, thank you. you. to give you some, some context for this statement uh, that, that we're seeing evidence of nectar recruitment uh, and tell you what we're going to do next about this. So it's a glimpse, it's a very relatively short piece of, uh, of data that gives us a great deal of hope. So, Lake Champlain, it's, it's the little lake over there, um, a little bit bigger than the lake we've got right here, but not as big as the other lakes over there. It's the other great lake. Um, this is a lake that was commercially fished in the 1800s, including lake trout. Uh, with shoreline seines, uh, they never did develop an open lake fishery except for a little bit of trap netting. So there wasn't a lot of commercial fishing pressure and it was closed in the early 1900s. So uh, interestingly, despite that, lake trout disappeared from the lake uh, by 1900, the last of them was seen in 1900. We're not sure why. It boggles my mind a little to conceive that a shoreline fishery for them by a few farmers doing something in the off season could wipe out a lake trout population. So it's not clear what the cause was. However, starting in 1970s, uh, they began, uh, they, the, the state of Vermont and New York uh, began stocking lake trout. Uh, they stocked from a variety of strains. The majority of the stocking was the Finger Lake strains, particularly Seneca, um, Adirondack strains, Lake Superior strains, and, and a few others. The key here is that every fish that stocks in the lake is fin clipped. So that's our way of not only estimating age, there's a five-year rotation, so you can get an approximate idea how old they are, but more importantly, we know exactly which ones are stocked and which ones are not, uh, because we can look for the unclipped fish. Now, in the early days of doing clip assessments, um, the data were not quite as good as they were later, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, it's, uh, fin clipping was new to the hatcheries back in the 70s, um, and assessing for fin clips was, was a little new. Uh, in 2000, I started with a graduate student looking to see whether there might be any evidence of natural reproduction uh, and or recruitment of this species. So we began an extensive dive series and looking for shoreline substrate that might indicate there were good spawning sites. See, we surveyed 14 different sites 
of those we found eight that looked like excellent spawning habitat. So there was really no lack of abundance of potential for an area for them to spawn. The state does adult surveys. Uh, they go out to two of the spawning sites in fall. They used to do electroshocking. They now do trap netting and basically assess them for lamprey wounds, but they also assess them for unclipped rings. Um, make a very important point here. There is no juvenile assessment done for lake trout recruitment in Lake Champlain. So the first sign we have that there are wild recruits in the population is by the time they reach these spawning areas, that is to say, they reach adulthood. And so we don't see them until they're at least minimally six years old, probably seven or eight or nine years old. So there's a long delay between any potential that there is an actual recruitment until we actually see them in a population we can assess. So if we look at the evidence from those uh, fall spawning assessments, what we see is um, a varying uh, uh, proportion of the adults that are unclipped. Now, that red line I've drawn in there is what we normally consider, at least in the Great Lakes, to be the error rate. They were either missed their clip in the hatchery, the clip wasn't read accurately in the tossing boat in the middle of the night uh, by the, the personnel on board, or it regrew to a point you can't easily see that it was a clipped fish. And I've seen a lot of regrowth of these fins in Lake Champlain where it really does take a second and a third glance to say, wow, the fins aren't quite symmetrical, it was a clipped fish that regrew its fin, it wouldn't have been easy to see at night. So if we look back, by the way, that dotted line, I don't have all of the data, uh, the exact data from, from the most recent years, but it's around 3 to 4 percent. Excuse me, it's around 2 to 3 percent uh, at, at best, and quite often it's about 1 percent. So we're below the error rate in most years, meaning there isn't wild recruitment into the population. Except you're going to say, well, what are you talking about, Mars? And around 2000, there's about 10% uh, uh, unclipped fish. Isn't that a sign there was some natural recruitment? If we look back at that data carefully, what we see is that that appears to be one size class, one presumably cohort of fish, moving through time and then disappearing. It looks like it was one year that either there was suddenly recruitment in that year or potentially it was a bad clip year. We can't tell. But it's disappeared, it's gone, we haven't seen evidence of wild recruitment in the last, uh, well, certainly at least 10, if not 15 years. So, uh, we do see reproduction. Here's the difference between the two R's, right? Reproduction in the lake is astounding. It's much higher than we see in the Great Lakes using the same assessment. So if we put down egg traps, we see very high egg densities. Yes, that is a real shot from Lake Champlain on the left. That is one of our spawning sites where there was so much excess spawning, they trickled off the drycenid beds that were covering the, the, the cobble, and we saw these windrows of eggs. Lots of natural spawning and lots of natural uh, uh, um, survival through to emergence. And that's a standard catch from one of our fry traps. We've got fry. The problem is we never see them again. So reproduction is great, recruitment is absolutely nil. So the logical thing, excuse me, the logical thing to do is to start doing the juvenile assessments. Now, I've worked on the lake for almost 20 years now, and periodically we go out, we run trawls for classes or for some other project, and so every time we run a bottom trawl, we look at it carefully and look for juveniles, any kind of juvenile. On average, in a year, over a dozen or more trawls for whatever incidental purposes, we might see six to a dozen juveniles of any kind. And in fact, of course, they're all clipped. So finding juveniles has been difficult in the first place, so it makes juvenile assessment difficult. Until we got the ace in the hole, which is Steve Cluett. And some of you here know Steve Cluett from Lake Ontario. He was a captain doing juvenile surveys on Lake Ontario for about 15 years before he went out to, uh, to Long Island Sound. And uh, he came to Lake Champlain about three years ago, and he's an absolutely amazing captain, as those of you who know who have worked with him. And I said, Steve, um, could we, um, could we do a little bit? Of, could, what do you think about juvenile trawling? And he said, Oh, yeah, bring it on. This is what I do. So we did it, and he did, and we did. We did one trawl in June, which made us hopeful because we saw some unclipped fish. And so we did some focus sampling in August. We had literally about a day and a half. We're talking of a total of, I believe it's 16 trolls done rapidly, these were 10 minute trolls over and over again. We got unclipped fish. We not only got unclipped fish, but as you can see here, we got unclipped fish 
of a variety of length classes. And if we were any doubt about whether, okay, you know, again, these are the error fish, the fish that somehow got missed in the hatchery, we also got unclipped young of the year. They're stocked at one year old. So these fish have to be natural recruits because they're way smaller than any fish that got stocked. So we do the little happy dance on the deck. We uh, caught a total of just a small one, it's relatively small, but it's more than 400. We caught a total of 426, of which 28% are unclipped. That's a lot. Now remember, we haven't really looked prior to now, because we haven't had the ability to get that trawl on the bottom where these fish are. It was Steve's skill at modifying the trawl that got us these fish. So, these are the data, length frequency data. For all fisheries professionals, you can see what I'm seeing. I'm seeing three very clear peaks in length. That says to me we've got three year classes that we haven't been picking up because we haven't been doing it. We've got young of year, we've got one year olds, we've got two year olds. So this isn't just a little flash in the pan, or oh, there just happen to be a few young of year, they're growing up, they're living. So it looks like it might be the tip of the iceberg. Let's compare that with the clipped fish we got in those same trawls. Adipose clipped fish, these are age one fish, and we see something that's not surprising. All right. These are one-year-old fish stocked. These are one-year-old fish wild. No surprise, the stocked fish are larger than their wild cohort because they get grown up bigger in the hatchery. Same thing, the yellow, a little hard to see in this room. Um, an interesting spread of the stocked two-year-olds. Um, I'm not sure that one way out on the left is a real one. Uh, I, I don't know why it's so tiny. There must have been something wrong with it. But again, those two-year-olds are longer than the wild cohort of two-year-olds. Again, no surprise, they grow them up bigger than the hatchery. Well, that's encouraging. So, uh, as, as Eric Palmer said to me when he saw this, he's our, our fish chief, he's like, why now? To which the answer is, I have the foggiest notion, maybe it just took patience. But we have to look at why now. The, the three possibilities that might, might hurt recruitment, disease, predation, starvation. We don't have any new diseases that we know of in Lake Champlain. VHS never really manifested itself. Predation, well again, nothing's changed recently. We've had ailment since 2003, so if they were going to do damage on predation, they're still <coughs> doing it, right? They're still eating. So we haven't had a reduction as far as we know in predators. If anything, we've had an increase in potential fry predators. What about starvation? Has anything changed in the food web? that might have changed, uh, you know, allowed these guys to have more food at the point when they needed to allow them to recruit. Well, we haven't had any major changes, but let's at least look at the diet. So again, we're dealing with just brand new data, small sample size, about just over 250 fish. We started looking at stomach analysis. And again, this is brand new data I got about a week ago from my text. These are the stocked fish that came into those trawls by their year class. So the dark is age one, the lightest is age three. They've got a fairly varied diet. They're eating mysis, no surprise. That's what they should be eating when they're small. They're eating sculpin, they're eating smelt, and maybe a smatter of other things. Same color scheme, but we also have young of year. We add the wild fish. Quite different. The wild young of years, which we don't see, of course, in the hatchery, we've mostly got them eating mysis. It dominates their diet. No surprise, this is what Bronte saw in Lake Superior diets. It's a readily available, rich food resource where those little guys are when they head down into deep water to eat. Interestingly, though, they don't, they, you know, there's a few smelt in their diet as they get a little bit older. They're not eating sculpins. We're not seeing sculpins in their diet yet. They're very highly mysis oriented. Mysis has gone through some substantial changes in Lake Champlain, but curiously, it's in the reverse direction. Very abundant in the 70s, they dropped out to almost nothing more recently. Is it possible that mice are actually making a comeback and we're not quite seeing it in samples yet? There's no clear evidence of it, but that would certainly be a smoking gun to say, huh, we were stocking fish for which when they spawned, there was no food for their uh, emergent fry. No wonder they didn't make it. Now somehow they're finding mice. So hypotheses, we can learn a lot more as we progress. What we're going to do next, of course, is turn this into a real project and start focus sampling on juveniles throughout the summer, multiple sites. I didn't mention all those fish were basically from one site. 
one area of the main lake in, uh, in 40 meters of water. Now we need to do it more extensively, see how much overlap we get in all areas between the natural and the, uh, the stock fish, uh, and, and look for diet overlap between the two and additional sites. And hope maybe we've got a, a significant progress to water restoration going on. So with that, many thanks to Captain Kluwert and our very able crew, Crystal Offices, and to the Great Lakes Fishing Commission, who didn't fund this as a specific study, but thanks to Senator Leahy and his vision for funding Lake Champlain, we were able to find funds to do this. And with that, we'll answer any questions. taking the, 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 the gametes from them and then stocking them back. Okay. So what we've got on the lake now is an admixture of the strains that survived well in the early days. And these days, all of the stocking is really focused on this Champlain strain, which turns out to be largely Seneca, you know, based on who they brought up from the lake uh, and a little bit of the other strains. So if we wanted to do the mixed stock analysis of who was parents, it's gone. We're already in the second, third, fourth generation, unfortunately. Helen, is yep. there any evidence that you know, there could be some competition that's truncating off those wild fish as well? Because it's pretty striking that the one-year-old fish overlap where the wild fish left off in terms of them being truncated. So is there any thought about maybe stopping stocking for a few years to, to maybe understand or stocking on alternate years? Or Bill, that's a heretical statement, don't you know that? Um, <laughs> it seems to have worked everywhere else, right? So, so, so the question is, is there competition between the hatchery and the wild? First, one would sort of expect that to probably be most severe at the earlier life stages. Um, certainly, if we keep doing this and we don't find anybody surviving beyond two or three, that would be, again, a, a hypothesis of why they're doing that. So, should we stop stocking? Um, I would argue we should wait a little bit. But certainly in Superior, when they stopped stocking after they saw wild recruitment, it took off. Uh, in, in Huron, in one site they stopped stocking, it took off. So I think that is the next step, but let's be certain that we've got a good solid recruitment and wild spawners coming into the uh, reproductive population before we think about that. But that'll be the next step. Mark. So, since you're island, what is the crappy? know there's been some changes in the vertical migration patterns of mices. Is that, is that good or bad? Are, 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 are these guys maybe learning that there's mice that are in a different place than they used to be? Or? If it's changing the distribution of mice that makes them available to uh, to make trap, bring on the methotrophics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, could be. It's an interesting hypothesis. I like that. That, that there's paper coming out on the change in the distribution. From Tim? Well, Mark May. Yeah, it works with him. Yes? The fact that argument has always been that Patrick's egg, regardless of what's all monitored or whatever you stop, always tends to be bigger than that they want to put bigger fish up. Rather than just backing off on stocking, make the argument to it you can save money and you might be having a better environmental impact by just don't make the fish, don't take it to stock. Because you're also you know, backing away on the growth potential that the smaller fish have which is the It is an excellent argument for doing something that I think we talked about for a long time, which is actually reduce that competition by reducing the growth rate. I think it must anguish a, a hatchery manager to say, what do you mean, hold them in back? Um, yes, I, I, that would be a great recommendation for hatchery culture. Uh, uh, um, it, it, we could probably get them close to the size that they are in the wild if we just slow them down. Uh, 